Welcome to the teaching ministry of Rev. Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. Pastor Baker is fulfilling the call of God on his life to preach the Word of God without compromise, raising up disciples who, through faith in God, will have a powerful impact on our world. May you be blessed through the message that Pastor Baker has to share with you today. May God's very best be yours. Second Thessalonians, come on, go back to Second Thessalonians chapter 1. You know, we already talked about in the very start of this series, why is faith so important? Hebrews eleven six. it's impossible to please God without faith. Right. And that's more than a born again experience. We're to walk by faith, not by sight. Amen. Sad to say the average believer walks by sight, not by faith. What they see, what they feel, what goes on around them, they allow that to dictate how they live and what they do. But the Bible tells us we're to walk by the Word of God. That even when things in the natural go contrary to what the Word says, faith can change it. Why did Jesus tell us in Mark eleven twenty three, 23, if you got a mountain that's standing in your way and what God has for you, you can speak to that mountain. You can command it to go. Now, see, a lot of people think this is a pipe dream. No, it's not. It's the words of Jesus. It's the words of our Father and a promise we have. And I'll tell you, for any believer to not want to walk in faith means you don't want to please God. I just told you, Hebrews eleven six. 6, it's impossible to please God without faith. If you don't want to learn about developing and grow and walking by faith, you don't want to please God. But if you want to please God, you need to keep learning about faith. And our faith can do what? It can grow exceedingly. Meaning what? Well, God gave you a measure of faith when you got born again, the Bible says. And now you have the ability to develop it. You have the ability to mature it and grow it, make it stronger. Christians should not be weaker year to year. Christians ought to become stronger in faith every year. Every time another year goes by, their faith ought to be even stronger than where they were before. Now, this isn't just for us to get what we need. This is for us to do God's work in the earth as well. We can't do His work without faith. But I guarantee you it's an awesome thing to get to be a part of, and it's faith that makes it happen. Amen? Second okay. Corinthians, come on, chapter 1, our foundation text. Thank you. Making sure you're paying attention this morning, see? Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. You there? Read this with me. We are bound to thank God always, Paul said. We're bound to thank God always for you, brethren, believers in Thessalonica, as it is fitting. It's fitting for us to thank God every time we think about you. Why? Because your faith does what? Your faith grows exceedingly. Now, there is no such thing in the Bible as this is only for the Thessalonian church. God's not a respecter of persons. He is a respecter of faith. For faith to grow exceedingly is not up to God. It's up to you. Yeah, it's up to me. There's a lot of people from a natural perspective that want to, you know, an example in the natural, get into better shape or people who want to have more knowledge about some subject or whatever. But it's not up to God whether you get more knowledge or whether you get in better shape. It's up to you whether you take advantage of what God gave you. He gave you what you needed. You got to take advantage of what he gave you. Yeah. So he said that we always are thankful for you whenever we think about you because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. Do you have any idea how different our lives will be as believers? If God could look down from heaven and look at our life and say, I'm truly grateful for that child of mine because their faith grows exceedingly and their love for one another abounds. How different would your life be? How different would your life be? See, faith that grows exceedingly isn't a prayer answered once in a while. Right. You know, most Christians' faith is kind of like a shotgun approach. <laughs> right. You know, they're not really aiming at anything. They're just kind of spraying it wherever they can, hoping somehow maybe they'll eventually hit something and it'll work. But faith doesn't work that way. Faith is accurate. Speak to the mountain. Mm -hmm. right. You have a need of anything, you call it forth, you believe, you receive what, what you specifically requested. Yeah. So faith is a powerful part of our walk with God on this planet. And you and I got to understand the importance of it because even in Corinthians, the 13th chapter, the love chapter, we're told three things we're to abide in right now. And the very first one is faith. 
Faith, hope, and love. Amen? These three things, right? Now, he said the greatest in the context of that setting is love because love works through, excuse me, faith works through love. love. But without faith, you got no ability to believe God. Without faith, you got no ability to walk in and exercise the ability of your trust in God to see God do what he says he could do. So, if their faith grew exceedingly, can ours? Yes, it can. Our faith can grow exceedingly. But how do we make that happen? Now, before we go back to what I left off on Wednesday night, I want you to turn with me for just a moment to Mark chapter 4. As we've been already touching on the importance of this series of understanding, as we've already read in Romans chapter 10, everybody knows Romans 10, 17. That's ever been in a good church for any length of time. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. But if that just means all i got to do is sit in a church and hear the word preached and faith will come, we'd have faith giants. Yeah. Right. A lot of people have heard a lot of word, but they're not walking any greater of faith. Right. Why? Because it's not just hearing in the natural. It's being able to really receive it in your heart and let it grow in you to cause faith to come. So hearing there is not just in the natural. you got to hear it in the natural, but it takes more than just the natural hearing for faith to grow. And it's the only way faith comes. What I'm going to show you again is we've already found in Romans 10, 16. Remember what he said? Not all have obeyed. Right. They, how can somebody believe? How can they exercise faith if they don't hear what the word says? But some have heard in the natural, but not all, not all have obeyed. Not all have believed the report. So he's not saying that faith comes by just hearing in the natural because you have to obey what you hear. And he said again in verse 17, so then faith comes by hearing. And the context is those who have a heart to apply what they hear. The term hearing means I am attentive. I want to hear what God's saying and I want to put that into application in my life. So here in Mark chapter 4, we actually hear from Jesus some similar words that will help us understand the significance of how we actually grow our faith. In Mark chapter 4, verse 21, notice what he said here. Jesus said, is a lamp, that which is illuminating something, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be sent on a lamp stand? What's the purpose of a lamp? To be put on a lamp stand. Now you're going to find out what he's referring to here is not really you and I shining our light for Jesus. Because we're going to keep this in context to what he's about to tell us. But what he's telling you is he's saying, I don't bring forth revelation of things and hide it from anybody. You're going to see this because you understand when you study the Bible, you're supposed to keep what's being said in context. Yes, there's other verses that tell us we need to let our light shine. Absolutely. But if you look at the context of what he's about to say, you're going to find out he's talking about the very fact that faith comes when, guess what? The word is illuminated in your heart. And I didn't bring it to hide it from you. God's not trying to hide revelation from people. Let me help you with something. God's not trying to keep any promise from you. Why did he give you a promise? Just to dangle it out like a carrot and say, come on, come on, come on. No, he's trying to get his promises manifest in our life. He, he didn't give you promises to try to make you earn them. He knew you couldn't. Jesus died and purchased all that's necessary for us. All things the Bible says that pertain to life and godliness, he's already provided. Why don't we have it? We're not exercising our faith. We're not growing our faith to learn how to receive it. Amen? Faith means I'm not earning it. Faith means I have a belief it's already mine because of what Jesus did, so I take hold of what's mine. Salvation today on the planet belongs to the worst of sinners. That's right. And honestly, all have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. Right. Amen. But you know, from the natural, people would think, well, a murderer, that's a pretty bad sinner. Well, guess what? Salvation belongs to him as much as anybody else. Right. The only difference of whether they have it or don't have it is if they exercise faith to receive what God has already provided. Right. So it is with us. God's not trying to hold anything back. The devil tries to make us believe somehow that God's not going to give us all that he has until we prove that we obviously desire to receive it and, he, and we've somehow proven to him that we've earned it. You're never going to earn anything from God. So understand, he's not holding anything back. Again, he's not hiding something under a basket. He's actually put this lamp up on a lampstand to illuminate to everybody. Verse 22, because there's nothing hidden See what he's saying? There's nothing hidden which will not be revealed. Nor has anything been kept secret but that it should come to light. I'm not trying to hide anything from you. That's right. I'm not trying to hide anything. Verse 23, notice what he says. If anyone has ears to hear, let him do what? Hear. 
Let him do what? Hear. Let him hear. Now, the parable of the sower was spoken leading into this, and the parable of the sower is all about getting revelation in your heart of the word spoken. And after he talks about the ability to do that, now, listen, this is a part of what we may talk about in this series. But, you know, if you're wayside, stony, or thorny ground, the Word's not going to become revelation to your heart. Faith won't grow in you. you got to be good ground. But coming out of that parable, he said, do you think that a person who has a lamp, me, who has illumination of the Word, is hiding it from you? Do you think I stuck it under a basket and you got to go find it and see where it's at? No. Why would I do that? My desire is to illuminate all of my truth to you because faith will grow in your heart as it does. Notice verse 24. Then he says to them, take heed what you hear. Underline that. Take heed what you hear. So this is a vital clue to how faith grows in the heart. Why is it Christians seem to not have the faith to exercise the, the, that aspect of faith and the promises of God and see them working for you? Because honestly, everything Jesus promised should be working for you. I said everything Jesus promised should be working for you. If it's not, faith is not being exercised. God's not saying, well, I'm not going to heal you today, maybe six months from now. Every promise we have in Christ that's already been fulfilled, he says, is yours today. Uh, God doesn't look at the sinner and say, well, I don't want you born again yet. We're going to wait six months from now and then you'll get born again. God don't determine that. And honestly, if you really think that's true, this is, this is where the false teaching of sovereignty has come into the body of Christ. Well, God's so sovereign. He's in control of everything. If that's true, then the Bible is invalidated. I said the Bible's invalidated, meaning what? It's not valid. If God is in control of everything that happens, then things He said in His Word are not true. Because you know what God said? This day I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, what's the next words he says? Choose. Now, why would he tell you to choose if you don't have a choice? Right. If he's all sovereign and control of everything, then you don't have a choice. Right. You have no such free will. Right? right. right? Yes. right. If God was in control of everything, Adam would have never sinned in the garden. Right. Right. If you don't believe that, Jesus said, hey, you fathers on this planet that actually still have an evil nature, that are still sinners, you, you give good gifts to your children. How much more will the Heavenly Father not give good things to those who ask? God wants to give good things to us. He's not trying to give bad things to us. The devil has done so much to tarnish God's reputation through religion and false teaching and people that don't know the truth. And if you don't know the truth, you're not going to be set free. You're going to be held in bondage. Can I get a better amen? amen. God did not create hell for humans. He created hell for fallen angels. When, when Lucifer rebelled. Now, if you want to go there with him, you can, but you don't have to. Thank God because of what Jesus did. But can you earn your way to heaven? No. Yes, but how do you, how do you become a, a partaker of eternal life? You have to exercise your faith for it. So how do you become a partaker of all the promises in Christ? You have to exercise your faith for it. God's telling me and you, I'm not holding anything back. I'm not hiding nothing from you. You're walking in the amount of revelation and faith that you want today. Amen. It's up to you, yeah. not up to God. Yeah. I said, it's not up to God. Yeah. I didn't take a lamp and hide it from you. Yeah. I'm not covering up revelation of the word. You have as much as you desire in your life today. Your choice. Yeah. Your decision. It's available. Yeah. It's available. Yeah. It's available. Thank you, Father. I said, it's available. Yeah. God tells us this all through his word. Yeah. I've made it available. I'm not hiding anything. Well, how come I can't find it? You obviously ain't searching for it. Right. Amen? Because if you do, the Bible says you seek, you will find. Watch this. So he says, take heed what you hear. Listen to this. With the same measure you used. Wait a minute. Now, before we go any further, what's he talking about? Hearing. Hearing what? His word. Because the parable of the sower is all about hearing the word of God. So he tells us clearly, if you take heed to what you hear with the same measure that you use. What do you mean measure? With the same amount of actual application to that word of God that you hear, you put into application. Watch this. With that same measure you use, it'll be measured to you. And to you who hear, guess what will happen? Who in the world determines how much revelation I get from God? You do. Who determines how much I hear from God? You do. He just told you. He said it's up to you. Mm -hmm. It's based on the amount of how much you will heed the word that you're hearing. 
to the measure that you heed the word you're hearing, that's what you'll receive. It ain't up to me, God says. It's up to you. And to those who hear, obviously have a desire to receive and walk in what he has, more will be given. Watch this. He's he not holding anything back. Amen. Christians need to wake up. There is no such thing as Brother Kenneth Hagin was a faith, faith giant because God chose him to be. No, he chose to hear what God had to say. He chose to apply what God had to say. He chose to act upon the promises of God's word. Even being persecuted and told he was a nut. Smith Wigglesworth, same thing. John G. Lake, same thing. Yeah. Amy Simple McPherson, same thing. These weren't faith giants because God said, well, they're my favorite little child, so I'm going to give them more faith. No, they were given the same measure of faith you were given. Guess what? They chose to grow it. Amen. They chose to make it become exceedingly great. And guess what? It was proven by their life. Yeah. And you know what the Bible tells me and you to do? Imitate those. Yes. Imitate them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So notice verse 25. Whoever has, whoever has, what's he talking about? Revelation of the word, illumination of the word. You're taking heed to what you've heard. Whoever has, what's going to happen? Tell me. Tell me. That sounds like faith growing. It is. See, as you gain faith, obviously, guess what's going to happen? More faith is going to come. You know why? God knows you're good for it. I said, God knows you're good for it. Yeah. Remember the parable of the talents? Yeah. He gave one, 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 five, one, ten. Right. You know what the person with a one talent always wants to do? Tell the one with a five and the ten what to do with their talents. <laughs> All the time. Yeah. But you know what? The one with the one's doing nothing with theirs. Yeah. Yeah, right. Why? Hey, wait a minute. Why did God only give them one talent? Because he knew they would do nothing with it. Yeah. Why did he give the other one five? Because he, he knew he would do what, what he had with five. Why did he give the other one 10? Because he would knew he would do everything he gave him with 10. Right. Yeah. Are you still here? Yeah. And when accountability time came, the guy with one lost his and they gave it to the one with 10. That's right. That's right. God's not doing that. That's their, that was their choice. Yeah. Right. He only gave them according to their willingness. Yeah. Ability means what they were willing to do. Yeah. Yeah. What are you willing to do? How willing are you to be obedient to God? How willing are you to obey His Word? Not a lot of Christians are because there's a lot of Christians on Sunday morning today sitting at home watching TV. And you wonder why they don't walk by faith? You wonder why we don't see the miracles and signs and wonders they saw in the book of Acts? Because that initial church knew we're going to obey God. Amen. 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 Going to church is not a bondage. It's not a religious duty. It's a privilege to get to come to God's house and be equipped to go do the work of ministry. To be able to do His work in this earth. Amen. If you're not coming to the house of God to be equipped, I'll guarantee you, you don't want to desire to do His work in this earth. Which includes walking in the blessings for your family. Amen. That's part of His work. Yes, it, it includes walking in health in your body. Amen. It includes walking with all your needs met. Yes. Am I going to get any good amens out of you today? Yes, so who is determining... This faith level in my life. You are. Who's determining how much I'm hearing from God? You are. What's determining that? Your obedience. Take heed to what you hear. Heed what you hear. What's it mean to heed? Do it. Uh, I, I keep saying it through this series, man. How many believers know things the Bible says they're supposed to do, but they won't heed it? And then when they need faith for something else, they wonder why their faith ain't working. If you're not going to walk in love and the Bible tells you to walk in love and you choose not to forgive and you choose to be a critic of everybody else and you're so critical of everything and criticizing everybody and always running everybody down, you're exposing everybody's wrongs and this is a failure and that didn't work and they're a failure and they didn't work. And then, I'm going to tell you what, they know a love abounding in that conversation. Yeah, amen, amen. And you expect your faith to grow. I think you ought to look at your own life and say, how much is my faith working for me? Right. Yes. And if I'm seeing some areas where my faith ain't working for me, I think maybe I need to wake up to the reality that I'm not taking heed to everything I know. Yeah. Mm. Amen. Yes, amen. I just read it to you. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus said the measure that you use is going to determine the amount of revelation you get in your heart. Amen. 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 If you want to be wayside, hardened heart Christian, keep living life your way, guess what? The Satan comes immediately and steals that seed. 
If you want to be stony ground, what stony ground? Oh, you may come to church once in a while. You may shout and praise the Lord once in a while, but you got no root in yourself. Christianity is not a lifestyle. It's a Sunday morning service. Right, right. It, it, it shocks me today how many Christians, Christianity to most Christians is a Sunday morning service. That's why a lot of churches have stopped having Sunday evening service. And midweek service, because guess what? The, the modern day Christians dictate to them, well, I won't come to church on Sunday night or Wednesday night. I don't care if it's just me and my wife. I'm coming to God's house. The Bible doesn't tell me to assemble less as the day approaches. It tells me to be together more. Amen. Our vacation, we're going to spend a whole week in meetings. Well, that's boring. That might be boring to you, but not to me. My faith is going to get even stronger. Amen. Amen. That far outweighs any kind of, you know, not, nothing wrong with it, but that far outweighs what an amusement park can give to me. Oh, yeah. Not saying you're wrong for going to one. I'm just telling you, man, my, the, the more I develop in my walk with God, the less I really desire those things and the more I want to walk with God. And that takes obviously wanting to have more of what he has for you. Can I get a better amen? amen. So I'm just telling you, we determine this. We determine this. We're determining, verse 24, the measure of faith we're receiving by how much we heed what we hear. How many know God knows the hearts of everybody? Yes. He knows already before you ever hear this message if you'll apply it or get mad at the preacher. <laughs> he already knows. And so if you are not going to apply what you're hearing, guess what? Guess who needs to bring this word alive in your heart? You can't do it. Listen to me. You cannot build faith in your heart. You don't have that ability. You don't have that ability. Who brings that faith revelation alive in your heart? The Holy Spirit does. The true teacher. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit. Let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Did he not just say that in verse 23? He said, he ears to hear, let him hear. In Revelation, he says what the Spirit is saying. Well, guess who brings revelation alive in my heart that builds faith? The Holy Spirit does. But guess what God knows? God knows whether you'll heed what you're hearing or not. If you're not going to heed it, why would he bring revelation of it alive in your heart? You're not going to do it. See, everything in the kingdom of God is reciprocal. I keep saying it. Everything in the kingdom of God is reciprocal. James 4, draw near to God. If I have a desire to heed what I'm hearing, guess what? I'm going to get revelation and even more will be given. Your faith level, according to those verses, study this for yourself. Don't believe it because I said it. I don't have time to read the whole chapter because we need to go back over what we're focusing on right now. Your faith level is not determined by anybody around you, your circumstances. You could, you could claim, well, I just don't have time to go to church. You know what? A lot of people could claim that. A lot of people could claim they don't have time to read the Bible, don't have time to pray. So could the disciples have said that in their day. But you know what? They chose to honor God and get in His Word and learn and grow. They chose to prioritize. This is significant to us because I want my faith to grow. I don't, now, if you're just happy with a casual day Christian and, and, you know, maybe I won't overcome battles and, yeah, I could be taken out and I could obviously be taken. But don't blame God for that stuff. Don't get, up, don't get mad at God and say, I thought you delivered me. He did. You just didn't have the faith to believe for it. Right? Because if you want to stay on a baby level as a Christian, imagine us taking kids uh, out, of, out of school, 18 years old, no training in the military, and stick them in the middle of a war zone. We're going to lose these kids, man. We're going to lose every battle we fight. You know why? They're not prepared. You know why most, so many Christians are losing battles? They're not prepared. They're not willing to do the training it takes to grow faith in their heart. In this world, guess what? You will have tribulation. Be a good cheer, Jesus said, because you're not going to overcome. I overcame it. Right? But how do you overcome it then? How do you overcome it? 1 John 5, 4. 1 John 5, 4 says, And this is the victory that overcomes the world. My pastor's faith. My wife's faith. My husband's faith. Nope, my own. What overcomes the world? Your faith does. Jesus already gave you the victory. How do you obtain it? Your faith overcomes it. Anybody want to do that? And I wouldn't wait till all hell breaks loose to try to start building your faith. Right? It's like, okay, so there's a leak in the dam. See that little hole right there in water? Oh, it's no big deal. I don't have time to mess with it. Then all of a sudden, it's a crack. Hey, I don't have time to mess with it. I'm too busy. Then all of a sudden, it's a bigger crack. I don't have time to mess with it. Next thing you know, guess what? The wall's gone. The water's pushed it out. And then you're going to get mad at God for letting the dam break. Preaching better than you're amening. 
God gave you the ability to speak to mountains, did he not? Yes. Did we not already read that in this series? Yes. God gave you the ability to believe to receive whatever he's promised, and you can't get it if you believe you receive when you pray. What determines my faith level, Pastor? The measure of which you're willing to heed what you hear. The less you heed the word, it's real simple. If you want to look at it this way, it's real simple. My faith level today is based on how much I, Daryl, am heeding the word of God. The less I'm heeding, the less I'm going to get. The more I heed the word, the more I'm going to get. I'm determining that. All right, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Because 1 Thessalonians comes before 2. And in the second letter that we already looked at the verse of, in the second letter to the Thessalonica church, we find out their faith was growing exceedingly. But that wasn't true in the first letter that he wrote. And that's why he wrote the first letter. He gave them 10 things here. In the first Thessalonians letter, chapter 5, he listed 10 things to them that they needed to do. Now, by the way, this isn't Paul writing this. This is God writing this, inspiring Holy, the, through Paul, through the Holy Spirit, to say these things. Yes. And so this isn't God just talking. Excuse me, this ain't Paul talking. This is God talking to the church at Thessalonica. And again, God's no respecter of persons. How many know any one of us could actually have it said of us, our faith grows exceedingly and the love for one another abounds. Yes. But they did something to get there. Yes. Right? Yes. Well, so you go back to the first letter to find out. Let's go get some clues of what Paul told them in the first letter. And if that worked for them, guess what? It'll work for me and you. Yes. They were obviously willing to heed what the apostle was telling them because in the second letter, it was recognized that their faith was growing exceedingly. Does anybody want to see that happen? Yes. We got through three of these on Wednesday night. I'm going to pick up here on uh, second. We're going to just read it real quick. First Thessalonians, excuse me, chapter 5. Walk through what we've already read, but let's just read all these verses and we'll come back through them. Verse 12, he said, And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. 14, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, Command, uh, excuse me, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, and be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. How do you know these are the things, Pastor? Because if you read the rest of the first part of the letter, he's correcting now what was actually some false teachings in the church. After Paul birthed this church in the area of Macedonia and Thess in the city of Thessalonica, guess what? False teachers came in. They began to teach him stuff that was contrary to what obviously Paul had told them. And so Paul has to correct that at the first part of the letter. One thing of which he even corrected in that letter was this. Remember he told them this? He said, hey, some of you have heard that the day of the Lord, the rapture has already taken place and you missed it. I tell you, it's not happened yet. So there was false teaching already back in their day telling them they missed the rapture. Jesus already came. He already captured the church, already took them away. So if you read the whole letter of 1 Thessalonians 5, none of it is directive in the sense of how they should live or what they should do. He's correcting false teaching. Now he gets to the end of the letter, and now he starts exhorting them on what they're to do. After verse 22, he just completes the letter by telling them that may the God of peace uh, himself sanctify and complete your whole spirit, soul, and body at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So may every part of you be ready at the return of the Lord. It hadn't happened yet. But may you be ready. How are they going to be ready? From verses 12 to 22, he gave them 10 things of instruction that you can see categorized here of what they obviously applied, they took heed to. Now, I guarantee you what, you probably wouldn't have had this in 1 Thessalonians 5 again if they wouldn't have been willing to apply it. Because God can only reveal to you what you're willing to take heed to. So here we have what they took heed to. I'm going to go back to verse 12 and start with this. Verse 12, And we urge you, brethren, recognize those who labor among you and are what? Over you in the Lord. This is talking about spiritual leadership. You can look it up for yourself in the Greek, but that's the reference. And they admonish you. Watch this. You're to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. So the first thing that they did here, number one, is they acknowledged 
appreciated and showed great respect for their spiritual leaders. You can study this out for yourself, but that's exactly what those two verses mean. They acknowledged, so they acknowledged their spiritual leadership. They showed appreciation and great respect for them. How do you show great respect for your spiritual leaders? You realize that what God gave them was to help you. Notice verse 13, esteem them very highly in love for, for, why? For their work's sake. What is a spiritual leader's work's sake? That would be you. You're my work's sake. You're the reason God gifted me to be a pastor, to bring the word of God to you, to teach you the truth, to help you get to know the truth that will set you free, to develop you in what God has for you as a child of God. Amen. Amen. If you don't esteem me very highly in love, you're my work's sake. You will not benefit from what God has from the word of God. The average person, I've said this for years, the average person, imagine this today, how different could church attendance be, although I don't think it would change a ton, but I think it might change a little. How different would church attendance be if Jesus all of a sudden showed up on the platform today and he said, hey, next Sunday, I'm going to come and teach you the word of God. Next Sunday, I'm going to be here at 10 o'clock. We're going to start the service right then and there, and I'm going to sit down, and I'm going to teach you the Word of God. Wonder how many people would be here at 10 o'clock. Wonder how many people would show up. Wonder how many people would make that service. But the truth is, if you understand the Bible, He gifted your pastor to speak on His behalf. He is doing that every single service. Amen. And for those that don't recognize that according to the word of God, this isn't I chose a vocation to become a minister. I didn't want to do this. You kidding me? If I'd have had my will, you'd have been on your own with somebody else. I wouldn't have been here. I'd have been doing my own thing. Just like every other human. But guess what? After I got born again, I found out I've been bought with a price. I don't belong to me. And if I keep getting my will, my faith ain't going to grow. And I'm not going to experience what God wants for my life. Can I get a better amen? Yeah. I'm not sad about what he called me to do. Not at all. But I didn't wake up one day and say, I think pastor would be a good idea, man. I'm going to go to sermon.com and start getting the hottest, latest new sermons that everybody else is regurgitating. That'll make everybody happy and tickle their itching ears and make them want to come back to church. That's not how you teach the word of God. The Bible says that you as a minister of God are staying the word of God in prayer. And therefore the Holy Spirit will give you what your church needs to hear. So who's that coming from? The head of the church. But see, there's a lot of people today that will hear the word preached. Now listen, it's different if you go to church and they're not teaching the Bible. But I guarantee you what, if you go hear the word preached in any church, you should not be at lunchtime going and telling everybody why you disagree just because you're not doing what he said. Right? right? Amen. Don't be a one-talent Christian. Because you're not using what you got, therefore you're not doing what you were told and you're mad at the five that are. The one with the five or the one with the ten. Are you still here? Yes. You know, it's like somebody mentioned this morning. You know, they said uh, to Pastor Barclay at his service, our pastor, because they're an hour ahead. He got this question. He said, what do you think about Jesse DePlantis asking $54 million for a plane? I'll tell you what. It sickened me in my heart to watch a believer that I know call him trash. Really? Oh, my gosh. Well, there's trash for you. I'm going to tell you what. I wanted to rebuke this brother in the worst way, but that's none of my business. Oh, you endorse a $54 million plane? That ain't none of my business. I'm not Jesse DePlantis. I don't, I don't report to God for Jesse DePlantis. I report to God for me. Yeah. Period. Yeah. He's a believer in the Lord. Have you known other believers that have sinned? Yeah. Love covers a multitude of sin. I didn't say he sinned. That's between him and God if he's obeying God. You know the only people that have problem with him asking for that money? People that don't give to his ministry. Yeah. If people that give to him and believe in him, they're, they're, that's why he's not asking for the world. He's asking his partners Amen. to pray about it and so and give. That's right. Whether he's right or wrong is between him and the Lord, and he will give an account if he missed God. What's so funny is you take somebody who actually goes and sells porn around the world, and they fly in multi-million dollar jets, and they show up in cities, and nobody says there's anything wrong with them owning one, and they're peddling, they're literally peddling all kinds of garbage and evil. But you get a minister that's, pedal, that's bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ who wants to have you know, a plane to get him around to do his work, and all of a sudden he's a bad guy. Whether it's right or wrong is not my decision. Whether it's right or wrong is not between me and Jesse the planet. That's between him and God and his spiritual fathers. Nobody else. But whether he's right or wrong for any other believer to call him trash. And then we wonder, I happen to know this brother fairly well. And I happen to know his faith don't work very good at all. He's somebody who does not operate in faith. He operates by what he sees, stuff around him. All that. He's not in this church. He's not anybody you know. 
Uh, I'm just telling you that I know the brother pretty well. I watch him all the time. I watch his posts on Facebook, things he says. That ain't a faith statement. You're looking at all the th stuff in the natural. Sad to say, you could be walking in a greater life. And this is somebody who literally thinks that living in adverse poverty and having nothing is the way to live. And you know what? I promise you, those kind of people, they're not so into the gospel. Don't tell me they're sowing to the gospel. Don't tell me they're giving to the gospel. Now, it's wrong for any minister, and I'll be the first to say, any minister who says, now, if you'll give this amount, God will bring you a miracle. There's no such promise in the Bible. There's no, plus, there's no place Jesus ever did that. I said, there's no place Jesus ever did that. For them to tell you, unless you give, you won't get your miracles, an absolute lie. To, to point that, at that statement out would be to say, that's not true. That's not what the Bible says. But even if they said it to call that brother trash is to speak against one of God's own sons or daughters who are born again like you. That's not walking in love. Are you still here? Would well, you agree with him asking for it or not? That's none of my business. I'm not responsible for him. I'm not going to get into somebody else's business. A lot of Christians would learn if you keep your nose just on yourself. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You go, hey, you got enough to deal with just with yourself. Tell your neighbor, I got enough to deal with just with me. I don't have to deal with anybody else. Got enough to deal with just with me. Well, I got an opinion. Well, so does everybody else. Everybody has an opinion, but that don't mean it's right. You know, if it's an absolute violation of Scripture, that's different. You know, why did, why did Jesus, you know, rail on the Pharisees so much? Because they were leading them away from him. They were leading them away from salvation and away from God, not to God. So you and I got to be careful, church, to recognize that we are walking in faith. And you're to esteem who? You're to esteem those who are over you in the Lord. Not every minister. He didn't say that. He said, you're to admonish those and esteem very highly and love those who are over you. Not rulering over you, but put in a position of responsibility over you to bring the word of God to you. Amen. I will not stand and give an account to you when I get to heaven if I preach what God told me to preach or not. I will to Jesus Christ and everything that came from this pulpit. I will stand before him on the time of the judgment seat of Christ, which, by the way, doesn't mean you're not making heaven. Every Christian is going to go to that judgment seat. The Bible said it in the book, in, in the book of Corinthians. We're going to give an account of how we lived our life for Christ. I said we're going to give an account. Why? Rewards are going to be given. It's what the Bible teaches. So I'm going to give an account for that. But so will you give an account with this verse right here. Just like me, I've got leaders over me. What if I don't do this with my leaders? I'm not going to grow in faith. I said, I'm not going to grow in faith. So number one, the first thing they learned was we're going to acknowledge, appreciate, and show great respect for our spiritual leaders. You know, the old saying is, you know, a lot of people go to church and they hear the pastor preach in the morning. And then they go to lunch and they roast him at lunch. <laughs> Now, I'll guarantee what, you're not going to hurt my feelings. I've had people say everything in the world about me that ain't true, lies, you name it. All because people don't want to live by the Bible. The Lord showed me recently, he said, I'm going I'm to bring this up in a teaching online for sure. But the Lord said recently, he said, you want to know why Christians follow false signs and wonders? I said, yes, sir. He said, because they seek them. And the reason, you want to know why the reason they seek them? I said, yeah. He said, because they're soulish. They're not spiritual. They're soulish. They want the experience. They want the feeling. The soul's mind, will, and emotions. They're walking out their will. They want their emotions touched. They want their feelings touched. But the Bible's clear. God confirms His Word with signs following. And the book of James actually tells us that you and I have to do what? We have to get our soul, mind, will, and emotions saved. How do we do that? By receiving with meekness the engrafted Word. How is it people can see false signs and wonders and call them of God when they're not in the Bible? Because if you're soulish, guess what you're not receiving? The engrafted word. And if you don't receive the engrafted, uh, this is the way the Lord so said it to me. He said, are you a sign seeker or a sun seeker? Which are you? If you're a sign seeker, you're going to fulfill your soul. You're, you're going to give your soul what it wants. If you're a sun seeker, he's the word. You're going to walk according to the word. You're going to see signs follow. Amen. And they won't be false signs. God. Can I get a better amen? amen? So our determination is whether we're a sign seeker or a sun seeker. I'm a sun seeker. And, and signs will follow the word. Amen? amen? Verse 14, moving on. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are what? Unruly. Warn those who are unruly. Meaning what? As a believer, if I see somebody who's living a life that's detrimental to them, it's going to be harmful to them, they're a believer. 
They're a fellow believer. Brethren, brethren. I see people, or in the context of unruly, would be a sinner who doesn't know Christ. Bring the, bring the gospel to them. And do what? Warn them. What do you say to do? Warn them. Warn the unruly. Listen to this. Comfort who? The faint-hearted. And uphold what? The weak. Be patient with what? Be patient with what? That includes your mother-in-law. Now, I love mine. I'm just seeing you know, people. That includes your father-in-law. That includes your kids. That includes your spouse. That includes your boss. Ain't getting a lot of take heeds to this message here. How many amens on that? Patient with what? All. You got to be patient with who? All. So this whole category is a list of different people. What's the focus? Number two, they did what? They weren't focused on themselves. They were focused on helping others. What Paul's telling them is, you focus on helping other people. You see somebody walking unruly, go warn them. If you see somebody who's faint-hearted, go be a help to them. If you see that somebody's weak in an area, be a strength to them. You got to be patient with everybody. With everybody. So if I'm doing that, I'm not focused on me. What am I doing? Exactly what Jesus did. See, all these have to do with what? You focusing on not yourself, but on the Lord. If you're focused on Him, you're helping other people. Right? Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. How many you know Jesus walked in great faith? Amen. I didn't come to be served. I came to what? Serve. But how many Christians come to church to be served? I, I got to laugh sometimes, you know, when people post online and stuff about trying to find a church. Of course, most don't know because they haven't been taught. You don't find a church. If you're born again, you're the church. You find a shepherd. And then, of course, everybody chimes in on all the stuff they have for you to do at their church. But none of that has to do with anything you growing spiritually. Amen. You could have the best young adults group. You could have the best singles ministry. You could have the best youth ministry. You could have the best children's ministry. None of that means the shepherd's going to teach you the word that's going to grow you up in faith. Didn't say he wouldn't. I'm just saying none of that determines that. But a lot of people determine whether they go to church based on whether it's got all the stuff they like. Well, who's the focus there? Me. I'm going to be served. Will the church give me what I want? I'll tell you what you need. You need a shepherd. Because if you get a shepherd, he's going to give you what you need. Yeah. It ain't always going to be what you want, but it'll be what you need. That doesn't mean no, no minister should be beating their you know, church over the head with the Bible saying you're a bunch of nobody. No. Do you know who you are? You're heirs of God. Right. You're joint heirs with Jesus. You're the righteousness of God in Christ. You can't get any more right with God. Come on, man. You're an overcomer. You're more than a conqueror. You're the head, not the tail. Well, I don't feel like it. You're walking by feelings, not by faith. Grow your faith and start walking in what you have. So number two is they were focused on helping others. That's what he's telling them in verse 14. Don't focus on yourself, guys. You, that, that's why we saw the result during the offering time of them giving willingly above and beyond what they had the ability to give. Why? They wanted to help, man. They're doing exactly what they were told. Now, remember, this is the group that was told that their faith grew exceedingly and their love for one another abounded. Does anybody want to do that? Yeah. Now, if you don't want to do that, just ignore this series. But if you want your faith to grow exceedingly, I'd get a hold of this stuff. It's pretty good stuff. I said, it's pretty good stuff. Yeah. Verse 15, see that no one does what? No one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. So this is a little different. You know what he's saying? Number two is don't focus on serving yourself. Work to help others. But here's number three. Walk in love. See, notice the direct reference here to evil. Because to not return evil for evil means I'm going to do what? I'm going to love them. I'm going to show that I love them. Now, I want to show you a verse that correlates with this real quick. We referenced it Wednesday night. Hold your place there. Turn to Luke 6 for just a second. Luke 6. Does anybody want to see your faith get stronger? Yes. I said, does anybody want to see your faith get stronger? Yes. How about your love abounding? Yes. How, how different would your home life be if your love is abounding? Yes. Luke 6. Didn't say it's not bad now, but it could be even better. Anybody say, well, my faith is where I want it to be. I'll tell you what, man, you're going to start going backwards. Because I guarantee you, just like a muscle, you stop using it, you'll lose it. Luke 6, 27, Jesus said, I say to you, I say to you who here? I say to you who what? Here. Now, now listen, every time Jesus now, you'll know this, every time Jesus talks about in the Gospels, he's talking to those who would hear. What's he actually saying in that statement? I'm saying this to those of you that will do what I'm telling you. I'm saying this to those. Remember in, in the parable of the sower in Mark 4. Do you remember this? I, I was going to go there today. I didn't have time. Remember when he said, 
To you it's been given to know. Now that wasn't just the 12. The Bible reveals in Mark 4 that it was his disciples beyond the 12, his group of believers. Most believe that was probably around 70 people, according to Luke. So it was more than just the 12. He said it's been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Not like because you're highly favored, but to them who are outside, those who don't have a desire to do what I'm telling them. I have to bring stuff in parables because they won't get the revelation of it. But he said, if they'll ever turn, what? Turn away from the way they're living now. Turn to the way I'm telling them. Guess what? Revelation will come to them. So he tells us here in verse 27, I say to you who will hear. Who's he actually going to talk to right now in this room? Those who will apply what he's about to say. The rest of you, this will just, you'll know it in your head. This is why the Bible says knowledge by itself puffs up. We got a lot of puffy Christians in the body of Christ. You know what? They got head knowledge, but none of it's revelation. You know why it's not revelation? They're not living what they know. Right. If you don't live what you know, you just become puffed up. Well, I know that. Okay. But are you doing it? <laughs> no, it doesn't mean you're doing it. Come on, man. And if I'm not doing it, faith ain't coming. Faith comes to those who heed what they hear. I hope I'm helping some of you today. So he says, I say to you who hear, do what? Love your enemies. Now that's not an option if you want to walk in faith. That's not an option if you want to have faith that grows exceedingly. Remember what he just said over to the Thessalonian church? Do not return evil for evil. Right? So even if you got enemy, what are enemies going to do to you? Evil. What did Jesus say to do? Love them. Now, that doesn't mean you got to love them by going up and wrapping your arms around them and let, you keep, let them keep stabbing you in the back. Love them from a distance. But, but, but don't curse them. Don't, don't strike back. Don't try to hurt them back. Amen. Notice, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. When's the last time you did something good to somebody that hates you? Listen how quiet it is. When's the last time that you actually purposely chose to do good to somebody who hates you? I hate you. What's your favorite Starbucks drink? I like, well, let me go get you one. Praise the Lord. What are you doing? Good to somebody who hates me. Amen. Amen. If I'm standing in line at a lunch counter, think of me talking to somebody else and I'm a believer in some center. I hate you Christians. I'm buying their lunch. Put that on my tab. Why would you do that? He just told me to do good yes. to those who hate me. This isn't something we just read and say, okay, I know that's in there. If you want faith to grow, you got to do what he told you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Faith works through love. This is all tying back to the fact that if I'm not walking in love, this part of why a lot of times my faith ain't working. When's the last time that somebody who hated you, you did them good? Reading on, 30, 20. Thank God these are your words, Jesus. I'm just reading your words. They're all looking at me like they're mad at me now, man. Bless those who curse you. Bless them. Don't curse them back. You bless them and you pray for those who spitefully use you. Now, that's exactly what Paul's telling the Thessalonians in verse 45. You do not, ret you do not return evil for evil. You don't render evil for evil. You pursue what's good, both for yourself and for them. What's good for the person that hates me? I'm going to do good to you. I just read it to you. What's good to the one who's done evil to me? I'm going to show love back to you. Come on, church. See, if anybody here want to have greater faith, all of you said at the start of this message, you did. I think I'm starting to lose some folks now already on part three. I got a word for you. If you don't grow your faith in this last day, evil will and is and continues to increase. It's not going to get brighter. The Bible says it's going to get darker. But for those who walk in great faith, it won't matter. Amen. No matter how dark it gets, darkness cannot overtake light. I'll tell you, a lot of Christians don't know this. When you're walking in faith, you're walking in the light because you're walking in, in the belief in the Word of God and the love of God. Right. And when you don't walk in the light of God, you're not walking in faith, you're not walking in love. To walk in light means you do two things. You walk in faith and love. 
If you walk in faith and love, you walk in light. And I'll prove this to you. Watch this. Watch how hard it is for darkness to overtake light. You could go over to the actual company that owns the railroad over here, whatever company that is that uses the tracks over here, and say, I want you to bring every rail car you own, fill it with darkness, fill it full of darkness, and pump it and, and, and truck it over here to ponder. And we want you to do whatever you can to get that darkness out of those rail cars and come pump it into our sanctuary with our lights on. It don't matter how much darkness you try to pump in the room. When lights are on, guess what? The darkness cannot exist. Darkness does not... Hey, listen to me. You need to understand this. Darkness doesn't overtake light. Light refuses to shine. Write it down. Darkness doesn't overtake light. Light refuses to shine. If the sun stays up, the moon can get up all day long. It don't matter. Darkness will not overtake light. Dark, I, you know, the, I'm talking about the moon just representing the nighttime. I'm just telling you, darkness, if the sun was to stay up all day, 24 hours a day, darkness would never enter. That's right. Christians misunderstand this. Well, darkness is overtaking me. It can't. You're refusing to shine your light. Because if you're shining your light, darkness cannot overtake you. Right. As long as you got a light on in the room, try to make it dark. You can't because guess what? Darkness can't overtake light. Amen. It's impossible. It's impossible. Amen. In, in heaven, Jesus is that light. That's why there's no darkness there. Darkness can't enter in. Why? Because he's shining his light. Darkness cannot overtake you if you're walking in light. To walk in light, you got to walk in faith and love. You got you to gotta do good to those who hate you. You got to bless those who, who curse you and love them. Pray for them. Now, I'm going to tell you something. We're going to get into this a little bit later on this series. This is why walking in extreme greater faith is hard. You know why? Because you have to go through suffering. Yes. And it's the worst suffering on the planet Earth. Yes. It is the worst suffering of mankind on the planet Earth. You know what it is? You don't get your will. You don't get to do it your way. Because your will does not want to do good to those who hate you. Your flesh wants to do everything but good to those who hate you. I'll never forget recently in the run up to, I, I just remember it because it was recent, in the run up to these elections where there was an a, a actual gentleman who was a Christian and a believer, and they were, it was an area where they were, you know, the pro abortion and pro rights thing was going on, the pro abortion and uh, pro life thing was going on. And the, you know, of course, you had the, the pro abortion, the pro lifers, and they're just going at, and I mean, they're at the point almost, you know, fisticuffs and stuff. And this one gal's up in the face of this one guy, and I mean, she just, I mean, she's, she's totally, you know, pro abortion. She's just cussing him out, just wants, you know, I mean, spitting everything, flying, hitting the guy in the face and all that, you know, and he's just standing there. And before she can get done, you know what he did? He hugged her. He reached out and grabbed her, threw his arms around her, and just hugged her. She's trying to fight to get loose. He wouldn't let her go. He just holds on to her. Guess what? She finally started fighting. And all of a sudden, after a while, she just kind of stood still. And he starts telling her, I love you with the love of God. I don't agree with your position. It's okay. We don't have to agree. If you don't choose to agree, that's your choice. But we don't have to hate. And I will not hate you, Amen. no matter how much you hate me. That's right. And when he let her go, tears were coming down her cheek. Yeah. Love wins every time. Amen. Love wins every time. Yeah. Terry Mize, one of our spiritual dads, we're going to honor this year, had a man in Mexico. He loved to try. He tried to help him just out of love. Try to pick the guy up on the side of the road. Try to get him a ride somewhere. And the guy wanted to kill him. Long, long story short, after he gets him to pull over later on, he's got a gun fully loaded. Man sticks it at his, at his you know, chest and literally point blank fires every single shot. And guess what? Not a single shot touched him. You know why? Because when you're walking in light, darkness cannot overtake you. You can, you can say whatever you want about that story, but I'm going to tell you what, the man stood there and witnessed it. And so did the man who pulled the trigger. What do you think that does to a man who pulled the trigger? Six times and couldn't even get one single bullet to hit you. Why didn't that happen for every Christian? They're not walking in the light. Darkness cannot overtake you. If you know your authority in Christ, darkness cannot, no weapon formed against you will prosper. See, these are not just words of a book, folks. These are lives, these are lives to be lived. If we choose to walk in greater faith. Are you still here? 
So notice this, in verse uh, 40, back to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 45, no one's to render evil for evil. You're to pursue what's good both for yourselves and for all. Meaning what? You walk in love. One last thing I need to throw in there about that. So what if I'm walking in love towards somebody and they stab me in the back? I wouldn't remain close friends. I'm going to tell you what Brother Hagin did because I love this man of faith who I've learned much from. He said, I still love him, but I love him at a distance. I'm not going to stay your close friend if you stab me in the back and show no repentance. Now, if you've shown repentance, I'll receive you back in. Uh, I'm not rejecting you. I'm just saying I'm not going to have you as a close friend if there's no repentance. Because if there's no repentance, guess what they're going to do? They're going to stab you again. You're going to allow it to happen. I wouldn't do that. I said I wouldn't do that. But you don't go tell anybody what they did. You don't go to Facebook and tell everybody what they did. This goes on all the time. It happened way before social sites. People just did it at the watering hole at the workplace. Yeah, you know where the water jug is or the coffee jug. But break time, okay, and you know what happens and goes on most of the time. They're going, man, I mean, people are just totally ra railing each other and tearing each other. Do you hear what sister? Oh, you hear what brother? Oh, you hear what that guy did? Well, there's no place for that in the body of Christ. Amen. Come on, man. Amen. Are you still here? Yes. Am I talking to people that want to walk in greater faith? Yes. Yes. Not just a basic form of faith, but greater faith. Yes. These are things you got to apply. You have to apply. Verse 16, we're moving on. Rejoice once in a while. Always. How often? Always. Rejoice how often? Always. Now think about the history of the church. We talked about this morning in offering time. You can go study it for yourself. This area of Macedonia was one of the heaviest persecuted areas of all of Christianity in their day. I mean, they're facing threats every single day. These people are in a position, obviously, then also, where the mass majority of the people around them will not buy their goods. They don't do, they're not doing well financially because right. they're not popular. Right. I think it's kind of funny because we're going to Keith Moore's church. I heard this testimony by Keith. He, he said, uh, one time my wife and I were in another city, and I needed a new suit. And so we actually went into this uh, men's place to get, or actually my wife did. I was busy, had something to do, so she went in there to get a suit. And she said, I need to buy a suit for my husband. Uh, he's in town doing some ministry and stuff, and I need to get him a new suit. And the guy, from, I don't know why he asked, but he said, well, well, who is he? He said, maybe I know him. He said, it's Keith Moore. He said, well, I won't sell him a suit. She said, you won't? Nope. He's one of them prosperity preachers. I don't sell suits to prosperity preachers. Get out of my store. What would the average Christian do in that situation? I can tell by your quietness what most of you might do in that situation. <laughs> what do you think you do? What do you mean you won't sell to them? What's the problem? I'm going to turn you in for discrimination. She said, you won't? No. Nope. Okay. I'm so glad that I got to know you today. Why? God's going to bless you. You're going on my prayer list. I'm going to pray for you. I love you in the name of the Lord. Sorry you won't sell us a suit. But I'm going to pray God's going to bless your business more than it's ever been blessed. Awesome. And walked out the door. Why would you do that? God said to you. God said to you. So your flesh will fight you tooth and nail to want to do that. <laughs> yeah. Are you still here? Yeah. So what's the next thing we're supposed to do? We're supposed to rejoice what? Always. Just when things go our way? Always. When everybody loves us and likes our Facebook posts? When, when all of everything in my home is going the way I want it to go? This is, ready? This is number four. They were unmoved by their circumstances. How do you rejoice always? You're unmoved by your circumstances. You're not going to rejoice if you're moved by your circumstances. They were obviously what? Unmoved by what was going on around them. They were unmoved by the fact that people didn't like them. They were unmoved by the fact they weren't popular. They were unmoved by the fact that they were being persecuted for their faith. Meaning unmoved means what? They didn't stop preaching. They probably got even bolder. They didn't stop giving. They probably gave more. They didn't stop loving. They obviously had to have loved more. Why? Because he said your love for, for all abounds. Amen. Right? Yes. Why? They were unmoved by their circumstances. Christian, if you want to walk in great faith, you've got to quit allowing the circumstances around you to move you. Amen. Rejoice what? Always. Always. Now, that is not talking about rejoicing in the circumstance. Thank God you brought this bad person into my life, God, to teach me something. God don't need to bring bad people in your life to teach you anything. That's as ridiculous as you saying, I'm praying for a gang member to hook up with my son, become a best friend so he can teach him something. No, most of you parents are praying him away. Right? right. God's not going to use bad people to teach you something. Right. Is he? No. 
No. Nope. What should you do? You should be rejoicing in his promises. I thank God no matter how bad it gets, I'm more than a conqueror. I thank God that no matter how difficult it may seem and nobody wants to buy my stuff, guess what? I will prosper because you're my provider. No weapon formed against me or my business will prosper. No weapon formed against me or my family will prosper. See, Christians who walk in great faith are unmoved by the circumstances. What are they doing? They're rejoicing always. Right? What does faith do? It rejoices. How do you know if you're walking in faith? Where's your joy level? See, the problem is we take joy based on feelings. But it's not based on a feeling. It's a spiritual fruit in your heart. Are you still here? You know the Bible says to offer up the sacrifice of praise? Why does it say that? The fruit of your lips giving thanks to the Father. Why does it say to offer up a sacrifice of praise? Because you ain't always going to want to praise God. Right? Come on, man. When Abraham took Isaac up there to offer him as the offering... He was the sacrifice for the day as far as Abraham knew. Isn't that right? Yes. He's still alive, isn't he? Yes. Did he want to get up on that altar? No. no. See, sacrifices don't want it. Living sacrifices don't want to be sacrificed. They want to get their way. But guess what happens when you choose God's way? He provides the sacrifice. Didn't he provide the sacrifice? Yeah. So God's going to see to it. You're going to get blessed. But you and I got to realize that we got to rejoice what? Always. Even when you don't feel like it. When's the time you need to rejoice the most? When you don't feel like it. How many times have I told you that? How many, and how many still mumble and grumble and groan when things don't go right? You want your faith to grow? You got to start applying the word to your life. Are you still here? Worst case scenario, if it's so bad, then just close everybody else out. Go get in your car, drive off somewhere, turn a praise and worship CD on and shut everything else out and start worshiping God. We're not praising him for the bad or the circumstances. What are we praising him for? For what he's done. Thank God you're my strength. You're my stronghold. You're my fortress. You're my tower. They're not my strength. They're not my fortress. You are. They're not my provider. You are. They're not my healer. You are. They're not my deliverer. You are. Rejoice always. Be unmoved by the circumstances. Could I get a better amen? amen. Wow, so I added one to our list on Wednesday night. Here we go. Praise the Lord. I don't care how long it takes to get through them. I'm going to obey God because I want you to get these 10 things. If you want your faith to grow exceedingly, think again. How different would your life be? Come on, Christian. How different would your life be if you're walking in exceedingly great faith? If your love's abounding for everybody, can I help you? When your love abounds for everybody, you live in a greater peace realm than anybody could imagine. When you walk in love abounding for everybody, stuff that people say doesn't bother you anymore. You quit getting offended and upset by what everybody says. And I wished I had about three more hours right now. Stand your feet. Praise the Lord. We pray that you are blessed by the message Pastor Baker shared with you today. For more spiritual resources that can help you in your walk with God, or to invite Pastor Baker as a guest speaker, just go to our website at cffchurch.com. You will find additional teachings by video, audio, and printed resources that will be a blessing to you. May God's very best be yours.